Hello, everyone. I am Victor Yates with the Black Alphabet Film Festival. The festival centers Black LGBT stories, and it will be held in Chicago October 13th through the 15th. And it is my pleasure to sit down with the incredibly talented Joshua X. Miller, who is a writer, producer, photographer, and filmmaker, who directed For My Brother, The Legacy of Joseph Bean. Joseph Bean edited the anthology In the Life, as well as Brother to Brother, and those um, anthologies have shaped the lives of a number of Black LGBT writers. And so I am super excited to chat with you, Joshua, about this incredible project. First, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for having me. I am doing so well. Um, I'm a little sad because here in Chicago, the weather is changing. So no more 80s and 90s. Now we're moving into like the 50s and 60s. But it's okay. There's beauty in everything, right? In L.A., it is. it feels like it's 85. <laughs> it is really bizarre weather. All right, so let's dive into it. What inspired you to work on this project? Um, so there's so much. So I first read In the Life, which was the first anthology that Joseph Bean edited, um, actually during the pandemic. And while I was reading it during the pandemic, it really felt very fresh to me, even though it was made you know, in, in the 80s. Uh, even though it came out in the 80s, it still felt very fresh and very relevant. Um, and it was almost like while I was reading it, there was something in me that was just kind of like being revitalized, you know, like I felt revived and I felt like I was truly listening to these stories of, of men who've lived before me. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to see kind of like the full spectrum of who we are as LGBT black men, right? Because I think a lot of the times we see through like media and other stories, how much people like pine after us, right? People always fetishize us as black men. And I think that these stories really gave an opportunity for our full selves to be seen on page, right? So like there were stories about you know, Black men who were uh, immigrating to America. There were stories about Black men who had children. There were stories about Black men who were dealing with HIV AIDS. So I think that the in the life and also Brother to Brother just gives such a huge um, look at to what life can be outside of just sex, right? And I think that that part of it all really just spoke to me as a, you know, young LGBT Black man. I just felt like I was being seen for the first time in this in in this book. Um, but also this was part of a uh, capstone project that I did for my master's program. So that was kind of like the added bonus of it all. <laughs> so it was like a little bit of like my, my personal connection to the book, but then also kind of like having those other um, those other outside forces on, on it as well. OK, I love that. Uh, one of the sections for In the Life is creating community. Um, yeah. During this process, um, did anyone talk about how community was created during the 80s um, pre-internet and social media? Yeah, so um, I actually spend like a, a chunk of the documentary talking specifically about the 80s, right? Because I think in order to understand more about like Beam's life, like we have to actually be transported back in time a little bit. So we have to spend time talking about what life was like in the 80s, why it was important for them to be creating this book where they were discussing things that at that time, no one really wanted to discuss. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I did continuously come, come around was the almost like camaraderie that they felt when they were a part of the community. Um, meeting some of his contemporaries and interviewing them like, um, uh, Gil, Gil Gerald, I believe is his last name. I might be butchering his last name. So I apologize, Gil. <laughs> um, he talked about just being connected in the sense of um, being the head of this big organization, this big LGBT organization back then, right? And then having things like um, newspapers that they would send out in magazines, um, but also like being able to like pick up the phone and call people and be like, hey, I saw this, you know, I saw this thing. It was shipped to me from Chicago. This is really cool. I'm wondering if you have someone who could be, you know, brought out here to teach 
teach us how to do something like this? Or what was what did it take to to do something like this? And then trying to replicate that. So I think even though they didn't have like the the quick fix of social media, right? Like, oh, let me put this blast out and then I'll get like a hundred people who uh, who are kind of like looking for it. They still had that connectivity between each other because of um Kind of, kind of like those central spaces that they were going, those central things that everyone would do. For example, one of the places, um, so while when I got the idea to kind of create this piece about Joseph Beam, I <laughs> immediately like booked a trip to Philadelphia because that's where he's from, um, born and raised there. And while I was there, I got to meet a lot of his contemporaries, but a lot of his colleagues as well. And I also got to go to uh, Giovanni's room, which is one of the oldest um, LGBT bookstores in Philadelphia. So it's like having kind of like those markers, right? Having those areas or those buildings where LGBT folks would go is so, so important, right? Especially during this time now in our history, where we're talking about the erasure of both Black history, but also LGBT history, especially in areas like Florida and things like that. Um, it's so important that we continue to give space to each other and that we continue to, to tell these stories. Um, so that's like a big, that's a big way that a lot of them kept connected, definitely. Yeah, I, I am from Florida. And one of the oh. reasons I left is because it's ultra conservative. Yeah. Um, I um, was experimenting with um, how I presented myself to the world. And what I received back let me know that, okay, this is not a safe place for me to live. Yeah. Um, and it's very unfortunate because like Jackson, well, I'm from Jacksonville. Jacksonville oh. is... Uh, but Florida has um, such a rich Black yeah. history that's mm -hmm. not celebrated. And I remember during um, the Super Bowl when Cheryl Lee Ralph oh, um, yes, 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 yes. Um, performed uh, the Negro National Anthem. Mm -hmm. And in Jacksonville, there was no one talking about how monumental that like moment that was yeah. for Florida because the writer mm -hmm. is from Florida. Yeah. And I'm like we are banning <laughs> black history. We're missing it, y'all. <laughs> we're banning black history, not realizing that we're banning Floridian history. Yeah. Um, so um something you said about um Giovanni's room and how it's so important to create space, share space. I um, like kind of like skimming through the table of contents, um, names that, um, literary giants that I love, like Melvin Dixon, yeah. uh, Asoto Saint, mm -hmm. um, Essex Hemphill, and my favorite Samuel Delaney, they are in yes. this anthology. And it really warms my heart to know that all of these individuals knew of each other and they were sharing space. Delaney, um, sci-fi writer, um, who was kind of like living a double life in the 70s. Uh, he was married to a female poet and including her poetry within his science fiction writing. Yep. And, but it's so beautifully written that you don't know where his words end and her words start. Um, but he was also going to these like adult theaters in right. um, Times Square and hooking up with male mm -hmm. sex workers. And so I can only imagine the gossip <laughs> that they were sharing okay. um, <laughs> in, in these bookstores, in these shared spaces. So among the colleagues and friends that you mm -hmm. spoke with about Joseph Bean, what are some things that you learned about Bean that you didn't know during the, the research process? Mm, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the biggest things, personal relationships that he had with people, you know, like um, when I was interviewing Gil, Gil said this thing that really touched my heart because it made me realize um, the relationship that I had with like my best friend, right? He called Joseph Bean, his brother, his his. I think it was his sister brother, right? Like they were so close that they were like sisters, but they were brothers, you know? And I think a lot of the times like when 
gay black men have that relationship with each other. A lot of people don't understand that, right? Because they they want to put labels on it. Like, oh, you two really like each other, but you just don't want to date each other. Or you two are doing things in secret. But in reality, it's just like, no, we just have a mutual love for each other. And that's okay. Like, it's okay to be really good friends with people and like truly deeply love them, but that it just stops at, at friendship. Uh, and him saying that made me really think about one, how we view each other, but also kind of those relationships that we have with with, with each other. Um, something else that was very interesting about him too was he loved bringing Black men together, which is something that, you know, truly inspires me as, as a creative, as a human being, as um, someone who's out here doing activist work, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, but the one thing that he never ever received was that love, that romantic love, right? That he wanted to see and with another black man, which is both like heartbreaking, but also it makes me think about how sometimes we put these literary giants or, you know, these artistic giants on a pedestal and we make them almost unreachable. So then it makes them unattainable. Um, and I think through learning more about him and learning and hearing these stories from his colleagues and his friends, it really allowed me to get a glimpse of who he was behind the writing, right? So it's like these words are so powerful, but who is that person behind the words? Um, so those are just a, a couple of a couple of things that really, really stood out to me. Okay. Um, going back through In the Life, mm -hmm reading it during the pandemic, what is your favorite piece in the anthology? Oh, I'm trying to think, I'll give two. The first one is the one that A. Billy S. Jones Hennon, um, who's, really who's a really good friend of Joe, Joseph Beams, and uh, also has kind of become a really good friend of mine through you know interviewing him and we've stayed in touch. Um, he wrote about coming out to his children oh. and how his children ended up coming out to him as well and how that relationship was, uh, but also just about parenting and and navigating the relationship between their, his children's mother and trying to express himself and growing up in an era where it was like, okay, we're not talking about this, but it's like, no, let's talk about this. Uh, and it's really funny because in the, in, the, in the piece, I don't want to give away too much, but in the documentary, he talks about how Joseph Beam didn't want to add it into the anthology at first because he was like, I didn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. They're like, this isn't a story people are talking about. And he's like, no, I know so many LGBT men who are out here and they have kids and, you know, they tried to do the straight thing for a very long time and it didn't work out. So, and he said, you know, I had to really talk to him about that. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, but I also, I love, 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 love. It actually inspired me to write uh, a play um, Joseph Beam's entry, uh, Brother to Brother, A Letter from the Heart, because he has this quote where he essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, he essentially says that we go through life keeping each other at arm's length. And that just, like that phrase, like keeping each other at arm's length, it just means so much. And it's so, there's so much you can unpack there. Yeah. And it just, it inspired me because it made me think about how a lot of the times when we are out in public or when we're out, you know, enjoying ourselves with our friends and we see other people who we know are a part of the community, how there's sometimes this one unspoken language that we have, right? Like, oh, okay, hey, like, yeah, I see you. But then there's also kind of this wall that we put up with each other, yeah. right? It's like, well, I don't want to be judged by you, so I'm going to act a certain way. I'm going to do a certain thing. Uh, but also just thinking about all these walls and the ways that we try to keep each other away. Right. Um, and we can go down the list of how we do that. But that's those those two those two uh, pieces are are really, really impactful. And it's so funny you say that because it's almost like you had that foresight too, right? Yeah. Like, well, we're not talking about this now, but think about this in the future. Like people are going to want these things. There are people who are part of the community that want these things. So this yeah. needs to be a part of of the life that we're showing. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was it's truly a great piece. Yeah. You know, marriage equality wasn't a thing then, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine life now without it. Yep. Um, so love that. Um, what were some challenges that you faced before shooting, during shooting, and then after um, the project had ended? 
I'll start with during. So during shooting, I wanted to make the documentary like solely about theme, right? Like I didn't want to be in the documentary at all. When I was editing the piece, I was going back and forth of like having narration or not having narration and doing like, because, so the thing is, is like, there's not much about Joseph Bean, right? Like there's, there's not these long articles that people can read. There's not, oh, here's some found footage. Here are like voice recordings. There's none of that. So even before, I'm going to before now, I'm skipping around, excuse me. Even before starting the piece, the biggest question that I had in my mind was how am I going to make an audience care about someone that they can't see, right? So during the piece, I, like I said, I didn't want to put myself in it, but when I was showing it to um, other people who were helping me kind of like really iron out what the, the narrative was, and then also my, um, a, a couple of my professors helped with this too, they said that they needed kind of like a through line and that I was the through line. And I was like, er, I was like, I don't want to be too self-indulgent and be like, yeah, me, 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 <laughs> you know, by putting myself in the piece. But it turns out that that's actually like what it needed. It needed that that thing to make people be like, okay, this is the this is the main person that we're going back to. And now we're talking about their interaction with all of these people to figure out who this other person is. Um, so I think before it was trying to figure out how to shape all of that during trying to navigate, putting myself into it. And then afterwards, so there are kind of two cuts floating around. The first cut is like a much shorter cut. And then the second cut, which I just finished this year, is a um, is a little bit of a longer cut. Okay. So after the first cut, of course, I wanted to expand on it. But I truly, I found myself back at the beginning, right? Like, how do I expand? But also, how do I do it in a way that it doesn't lag? Um, especially because we're in this fast paced society now where if, if, if I don't have it in the first 30 seconds, honey, I'm not watching it. You know, I have so many friends they are like, oh yeah, in the first 10 minutes, I turned it off. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, no, it gets good after that. Yeah. Uh, so my biggest question to myself was what am I trying to say? Um, and how can I bring in kind of today's society into that? Uh, and I think I created a clever way of doing that. Oh, I'll have have to let the audience decide on if they like it or not. <laughs> One thing that you said stood out about images of Joseph Bean. Mm -hmm. um, are there, was there no like found footage? Like, cause I'm, I'm picturing like, I've never seen him in a documentary. I've never right. seen him. Uh, of course I've seen photos, but never kind of yeah. like moving image. Is there no moving images of him? Uh, so when I went to Philadelphia, I met with uh, one of his colleagues who helped him actually with the first manuscript of In the Life. Okay. Uh, his name is John Cunningham. And what he ended up telling me is after Joe passed, um, his mom, who was a huge and I, I feel I feel like I almost did him a disservice because I didn't talk about his mom as much as I wanted to. But also, I'm like, I don't want this thing to be <laughs> two hours. <laughs> so um, his mom had a huge part in, you know, both the work that he was doing, but also finishing uh, Brother to Brother, which was the second that. anthology. Um, if it weren't for her and, and Essex, you know, it wouldn't, the second anthology wouldn't be. But um, his mother ended up calling John and essentially saying, I have all of his writings and I don't know what to do with them. What do you want me to do? And it's so funny because he said he called Essex and the suggestion that Essex uh, gave him was to essentially put it in to, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the name, the Schomburg in New York. And it's so funny because John told me when I interviewed him in person, he was like, if Essex would have said, give it to Howard, um, I would have done it, you know, because it, he, it's a historically black college, like it's for the people, like they'll have it, they'll archive it, they'll take care of it. Um, but all of the rest of his writings, um, any like voice recordings that he would have had are actually at the Schomburg, which I went to New York, and did not know that you needed a week reserv reservation to actually see everything. So I was like, okay, great. So I'm gonna have to re redo the trip <laughs> and go back. But so Beam, um, Beam actually was on the 
precipice of all of the big boom of like television and video in the 90s, right? Like right before the 90s, late 80s, mid 80s, it was really mostly radio, print, things like that. So most of the pictures that I have seen, but also have interacted with of him came from from that. It came from um, pictures that were taken. It came from conferences where they took pictures and, you know, they were doing talkbacks and things like that. So all of the like big boom of, oh, now we're recording things. He truly passed away like right before that, because uh, one of my favorite films, Tongues Untied, um, is kind of an homage to his work that he did with both Brother to Brother and uh, In the Life. Um, actually, a lot of the pieces that are in that film are taken from both those books. So it's a, it's a great kind of... Um, translation of that in a, in a digital sense. So he doesn't live anywhere by himself digitally, but artistically he does. Okay. Oh, that's so sad because I always confuse Tongues Untied with Black Is Black Ain't. Uh, so I want to say well, that that's such a great film. Yeah. Black Is Black Ain't fe features a lot of Black LGBT people mm -hmm. um, talking yeah. about culture yep and so i was like wait is he in that but no, i know no so those those were shot after he had passed yeah oh okay and i i don't quote me on this but i actually think tongues untied was marlon's way to kind of honor joseph joseph bean i love that yeah were they friends they did know each other because okay. i do i'm not sure if I do believe Marlon Riggs has an entry or something in Brother to Brother. Okay. Um, he might have something in In the Life, but don't quote me on that either. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I have the books in the other room. <laughs> I, his name is not in there. His, his name isn't in there. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so December 28th is Joseph Bean Day in Philadelphia. Yes. What can people do on that day mm -hmm. to celebrate his life? Uh, that's a great question. So his mom, after he passed, actually started a scholarship in his name at Temple University. So there is probably some way to give to that scholarship. Um, you can make a donation to that scholarship. But Josephine was really all about the community. He was all about lifting up other other people in the community, but also making sure that they had both the resources and the foundation to share their stories. So I think that the best and the easiest way to do anything on Joseph Beam Day would be to donate, right? Donate to one of your favorite LGBT artists. Uh, you can also probably donate to Giovanni's Room, which would be a great, great cause to donate to because it's truly a piece of living history um, that is accessible to everyone. And they still sell books today. Okay. Why did you become a director? Ooh, <laughs> everything else was taken. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I, that's a great question. I, I think it happened by accident. Uh, most of my life, I actually just wanted to be a performer. Like I wanted to be on stages. I wanted to be front, front, front and center on the camera. But I think through learning how to edit how to interview people, how to actually create a story that is um, living and breathing, right? Because none of this stuff is ever really done. Like in 10 or so years, I'll probably revisit it and be like, great, let's do it grander now. Um, especially because a lot of the people who I've interviewed, a lot of them are are elders, right? So yeah. they are they're but they don't have a lot of time. So it's like we gotta, we gotta get them while we can. Um, but I think the director. It's funny because I'm like looking, I'm like thinking back over my life and thinking about all the times where I've always like sat and judged things like other art. And I'd be like, no, like this moment isn't right. It needs a little breath here or it needs more. Like we need to speed up to it. So I'm, I'll just say, I think I've always been a director, right? I think I've always been that person who likes to make things happen. And now it's just kind of manifesting its way in that, in that, in, in that way, right? It's manifest, it's manifesting its way in me becoming a director, me producing things, me being a part of all these different creative uh, outlets, but also helping other people kind of sharpen their skills and get connected to other people who are doing similar things or who are really pushing the envelope on what it means to create art. So yeah, that's that's why. Okay. Speaking of helping other people, um, name 
five films that up and coming filmmakers who haven't touched a camera name mm-hmm. five LGBT films that they should watch to become better filmmakers. Ooh. So some of my favorite films, I already said one, Tongues Untied. Yeah. Absolute masterpiece. And I think it's a great representation of how a film can be very simplistic, but also be extremely impactful, right? Yeah. Um, I think everyone should definitely see Paris is Burning. I think that's just a given, you know? Um, it, it, it explains ballroom culture. It is a, a, a piece of a work where we continuously quote it and we don't even know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, other LGBT films. Oh, uh, this one film called Smoke Lilies and Jades um, follows the life of, I'm not sure if it is following the life of the author of the piece titled with the same title, but it follows a character who's you know, coming into grips of, of who he is. And it does take place during one of my favorite periods of art, which is the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, so one, two, three, okay, two more. Uh, this great film on uh, Amazon Prime called Brother to Brother, named similar to uh, the second anthology that uh, was edited by Joseph Bain and Essex Hemphill, um, Hemphill, sorry, uh, with Anthony Mackie, follows the story of Richard Bruce Nugent, who is just a phenomenal, phenomenal writer. And another LGBT film, oh my gosh. Uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. Uh, one that I've seen recently that is just spectacular because it talks about, you know, being uh, trans in the world today. Uh, it's called Kokomo City. So I think that's oh, okay. a great film and anyone can watch and 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 get something from. Yeah, Kokomo, Kokomo City is actually selected for the Black Alphabet Film Festival. So that's people true. who attend, they can watch it over. And, and so yes. Tongues yeah. Up Hide received a national endowment for the arts grant Mm -hmm. and it aired on pbs like not edited and at all caused (laughs) uproar that pbs like changed some things that they show on (laughs) on public tv and so how incredible that black gay man yep. was able to disrupt. Okay. Because um, that's and, what we do best. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and to make changes. And it's such a beautiful film. So everyone should watch it. And Paris is Burning is one of those films that like RuPaul quotes it every episode of Drag Race. Every episode. And so it's become such a huge part of culture. But strangely, some people don't even know that it exists. Yeah. Um, I love that um, the TV show Pose, some of the characters who are in Pose yep. appeared in Paris is Burning. It has a global yeah. reach. And yeah. so I think that's the definition of what a good film is, yeah. is that... One, it's universal Mm -hmm. and that people can see themselves in um, the characters or the subject matter. And um, you said something that good art, it lives and breathes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so outside of those films, what are some characters, some Black LGBT characters from a TV show, a movie that you thought this person is living and they have a beating heart ab- above the page. Mm. Okay, this is going to take a minute because I like one of the things that I pride myself in is like watching a lot of specifically black LGBT films. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm really like sifting through everything that I've watched and that I have like thoroughly enjoyed. Okay. And I suck at character names. So ah! bear with me. <laughs> I'll remember an actor before I remember a character's name. Uh, I will say, okay, so I mentioned one film, Brother to Brother. Yeah. 
um, starring Anthony Mackie. And I truly think that that film, so it, it does a really good job of both taking the past and the present and kind of putting them you know, on a scale and like weighing them next to each other because it's following the life of this, um, this truly like esteemed writer, right? So Nugent, who is one of the, who I like to call the founding mothers of the <laughs> Renaissance, um, is we're, we're learning about his life story. We're learning about how he got involved. We're learning about how the activism came how the writing was just like you said, right? Disrupting the norm. Um, and also how they were fighting back through their writing. Um, and I think it's it's a great representation of how the past can influence the present, right? The past being Nugent's character and then the present being Anthony Mackie's character. And how a lot of the times we sometimes forget to ask, what is the story here? What is, what is, um, the meaning behind this or what are we missing? What did we lose along the way? And I think that Brother to Brother does a great job of kind of filling in those blanks and giving us kind of this roadmap of how we can begin to fill those blanks in. And another one, I'm going to I'm gonna be stereotypical here. I was a very huge fan of Noah's Ark. <laughs> I remember watching it on Logo, okay? And um, I, I just love how it was sitcom-y, but also talked about real world things uh, and also gave an opportunity for us to watch Black men just express who they were through sexuality, through uh, academics, through love, through hurt, through loss, through experimentation. And I think it's just so beautiful for us to see all types of black men, right? Not just the very muscular, the curvilicious one, the one with the cute face, but it's it's all of it, right? It's the one who is, you know, from down south and is up here now with, you know, his man and they've been together for 15 years, you know? It's the one whose whole life is academia and like that's what he does and nothing else matters until it does. Um, it's the one who's promiscuous. It's the one who's figuring his life out. And I think that it's, it's coming back, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Um, but also reboots scare me a little bit because I'd be like, ah. oh my goodness. Um, but I, I I believe in the team, so I'm yeah. I'm trusted that they'll 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 continue on with that glory. So yeah. I'm excited for people to jump back into that world, right? I'm excited to jump back into that world. Yeah. And I'm trying to think another one, another one. Okay, rules of threes, rules of threes. <laughs> um uh, gosh. Uh, Goodness. Okay, I'll just stick with those two. I'll stick okay, with those. All right. So I will say for um, well, Patrick Ian Polk is getting his roses right now. Okay, yes, um, he is. He I didn't know this, but he writes for P Valley. And so he writes for P Valley, which is on Showtime. Yep. And the reboot will also be on Showtime. Oh, okay. Cool. I'm a little shocked that you didn't mention Moonlight is one of the best <laughs> films ever. And I'll say, Moonlight is something that is just like, I, I've seen countless TV shows, films, but yeah. Moonlight is one that like, I wake up thinking about it every single day. And it was filmed in Florida. I was gonna say, yeah. It's <laughs> and I'm such a fan that um, during the pandemic, I actually went to Miami like 40 times. And, and like, I, to different places. I went to the diner. Okay. Um, and I did a little like um, a video showcasing my editing skills using the Aretha Franklin song that's featured Ooh. in the film. Yeah. Um, which is like I hear that and like I like start to tear up. But mm. Moonlight. If anybody's watching this and you have not seen it, yes, watch it. See it. Yeah. And see then. It. David Makes Man, which was on OWN, oh, yes. um, yeah. is such a beautiful film. And yeah, I, I mean, TV show, TV show. And I'm, I'm going to add that, add that third one in. There is a new, uh, new, right? Uh, t you, it was a YouTube television show, and then Slay Television picked it up. It's called For the Boys, I believe. Yes. Um, 
Coleman Domingo is the one of the producers behind that. Yes. Yeah. It is like absolutely amazing. And I just love that it's like a new generation telling like similar stories to yeah. like Noah's Ark, uh, but also then like bringing in what it's like being black and LGBT now. Um, it's truly amazing. So that yeah. whole, th that, that team, kudos to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, we're, we're always working. And I think it's, it's important to have like those areas where our stuff is being shown because yeah. I'll be honest with you. It's sometimes difficult to get into a lot of these film festivals because of it the is. entrance fees or yeah. all of this other stuff. But I think it's, it's amazing to know that there's an organization out there who is specifically looking for your story. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's it's. I'm, I love that you went to that. Okay. What projects are you currently working on that you can share with? Uh, me? That, that's so funny. <laughs> I am. I don't want to say I'm on a hiatus because I'm not. Um, so after finishing the documentary, I gave myself a little time to just kind of like let the spirit of uh, creativity flow. Um, what I love to do is I always like if I have ideas and like now is not the time to work on them. I truly just write them down in a notebook. So I have a notebook just filled with like ideas that I want that I want to work on, that I either want to pass on to people who I know will want to work on it. So right now I am, uh, <laughs> I've moved from the screen to the stage. I'm uh, finishing up and doing some rewrites on a play that I uh, started, gosh, I want to say four years ago and it's completely done but you know how you let something sit and yeah. then you think about it and you're like no i gotta go change this so yeah. i'm currently adapting that and perfect where can people find you yeah so i'm on instagram you can find me at j creative but instead of a c it's an x so it's j x r e a t i v e and then if you would like to follow the Instagram for For My Brother, that is For My Brother Doc, all one word. And it's really cool because I like to, uh, if, if you don't know me, like I love putting a mirror up to society and being like, how are we different? How are we not? Um, so on the uh, Instagram for For My Brother, I have kind of like side by sides of pictures that were in the anthology, in the life and brother to brother. And I've like remade them with friends of mine, the help of friends. Okay. Love your friends, y'all, because they are your biggest support. <laughs> um, um, so it's kind of like a then and now type post, uh, which is really, really, really cool. So that's where you can find me. Okay. It has been such a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I hope that the world sees and loves um, your documentary film project. Um, me too. <laughs> thanks so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.